money was simply just energy and it was energy that could work for you or work against you but it was no matter what you believed about it whether it was good or bad or whatever the same dynamics were going to apply all the time and so i realized it'd probably be best something not to ignore but even on the other side of like ignoring it mastering it and understanding the fundamentals of how money works and how money moves hey it's rocky welcome to richer soul Today's guest is Will Brown, who made over a million dollars in real estate before he was 21. Imagine it's 12 months from now and you've achieved your major life goals. How does it feel to be in the best shape of your life, to wake up energized, excited about the day, to have great relationships and friends who support you and propel you forward? How does it feel to have an excess of money, to be able to make the choices you want, to be fearless and open to trying new adventures? Imagine being connected to the universe and it providing everything you desire It's possible over time, and your past does not dictate your future. The only thing holding you back from this vision is you. It's time to take control of our thoughts and use them to our advantage. Welcome to Richer Soul, where we achieve our dreams and create harmony to health, wealth, relationships, time, and spirituality. If you have not had a chance to listen to episodes one through nine, I encourage you to go back and listen to the framework behind Richer Soul and how to create the life of your dreams. You can also find all the show notes for this episode at richersoul.com. Today's quote is from Pearl S. Buck. The young do not know enough to be prudent, and therefore they attempt the impossible and achieve it generation after generation. That's our story today as we meet Will and see how he is able to create his own path in life. Too often we hold back our youth. It wasn't like that years ago. They went out and conquered the world at a young age. Now we tell them it's not safe. Actually, it is. And I'm thrilled to see our youth going out and changing the world. This is another one of the episodes recorded live at GoBundance in Park City, Utah. GoBundance is all about living the tenants we've talked about on Richer Soul. Now you get to see people who are actually living this life. They vary in age, as you can see with today's episode, and they each have different success, but they're finding their path to their ultimate life, and they're going to share the lessons they learned along the way. I hope they inspire you to find your tribe and take action to live your ultimate life. As you know, these will all be releasing on Thursday each week, and they have the GB designation so that you'll know that they are different than our normal weekly episodes. This entire series is brought to you by Profit Answer Man Podcast, where we help business owners ensure they are always profitable and can afford the life of their dreams. Check it out if you're a business owner. William Brown, in 2016, at 16 years old, attended a seminar and learned about real estate investing. He saw real estate not only as an access to financial freedom early on, but also as a way to build a bridge between the world in his head and the world beneath his feet. Armed with $30 to his name and a deep understanding of real estate, built over a thousand dollars hours of research and a hunger to carve out his own path, he dropped out of school from the College of William and Mary in 2018 and built a million dollar real estate investment business from scratch. But that's not all. He then founded an artificial intelligence startup named Titan X, which is committed to building the world's smoothest customer experience through context-based natural language understanding technology. He plans to transform the modern customer service in every industry through the use of smooth and intuitive AI while laying the foundation for a future 
where human computer human computer communication is seamless and drastically lowers the learning curve for people across the world who will need reskilling due to humans transition into the artificial intelligent age. Let's meet Will and hear his story. Welcome to Richard Soul, William Brown. It's great to have you join us today. Hey, thanks so much for the opportunity to chat. I'm excited to learn from you today. We always like to start at the beginning. What was it like when you were growing up and how much did your family and school teach you about money? Yes. Yeah, so I've learned that there's two ways to learn from people who you want to do what they do and from people who you don't necessarily want to do what they do. And so growing up, I learned most of what I knew about money actually through playing video games and through really quick feedback loop, really, you know, instant gratification type of you try something, you either we either works or it doesn't work, right? Playing in these games. And you see your your balance, your coins, your gold, right? Whatever it is, either going up or going down. And so those fundamentals was I learned it in a way that was fun. When I looked to school, the only financial education I ever got was this like part-time online class that I took as like a junior in high school. And that basically it was teaching me what a savings account was and what a CD was. And basically saying, here's the trade-offs. Like that was it. It's like, are you serious? And at the time I was, uh, I was learning about real estate investment because uh, luckily like my mom thought to bring me to a real estate investment seminar because she thought she knew I was sort of interested in this kind of making money type of game. And I was able to really see how the system that we have set up so far was built for the industrial revolution. It was built to create workers. It wasn't built to necessarily create entrepreneurs. And I'm not sure if I have a perfect definition of entrepreneurship, but if I look back onto our species histories, as hunter-gatherers, we were entrepreneurial. As agrarians, we were entrepreneurial. It wasn't until this industrial revolution that we started going and building a system that basically taught people to don't worry about your passions. Don't worry about creativity. Just focus on learning how to do this one thing and do it again and again for eight hours a day, 40 hours a week, 40 years. And I just, I, that didn't really seem like an interesting path for me to follow. And I wanted to carve my own path. And so inside of that, I started to listen to podcasts um, compounded off this real estate one. And I saw that money was simply just energy. And it was energy that could work for you or work against you. But it was no matter what you believed about it, whether it was good or bad or whatever, the same dynamics were going to apply all the time. And so I realized it would probably be best something not to ignore, but even on the other side of like ignoring it, mastering it and understanding the fundamentals of how money works and how money moves. And that sounds pretty typical. My son loves playing video games and I know a lot of parents uh, fuss over that. And we just had a simple rule. If you want to play video games, make money at it. And he, he's won over 10 grand playing video Amazing. games. Amazing. So. Nice. I'm cool. I'm like, I understood what was going on. I'm like, hey, if you can make money playing video games, you get paid and have fun, I'm perfectly all mm -hmm. uh, with it. As to entrepreneurship, you know, if you think back to the old days, you go to a town and there would be somebody who made horseshoes, right? It's a blacksmith and there was a baker and there were people who essentially ran their own businesses small, tiny businesses, but they still were on their own two feet doing their own thing. The school system was designed, as you said, to create factory workers, right? Here's the bell, ding, 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 sit mm -hmm. in your seat, do what you're told. And the world has changed. So even from that standpoint, we don't even need factory workers anymore, in a sense. It, but yet the school system hasn't changed. You go back to a classroom from a hundred years ago and the curriculum's the same. Yeah. How scary is that? Very scary. And that's why I encourage people, break the paradigm, find your own path. I think too many people think that in order to educate your kids, that you have to do it yourself. And the reality is YouTube is probably the best educational channel out there and it's free. Now, you have to figure out the good from the bad, but it's definitely, definitely doable. A hundred percent. And it's just, I think, sort of prevailing sentiment is that, you know, screens are bad. Um, you know, and to some degree, we have social media companies that are using AI to basically monetize our attention and sell it to advertisers. But 
YouTube, I 100% agree. Um, I've learned a lot of what I know on YouTube. And I also learned a lot of things that are really fascinating to me that I couldn't tell you why I need utility to understand like why rocket ships were or like how they work or new cutting edge fields. But it's the things that are interesting to me. And the idea that you can just go with a click of a button and pretty much learn whatever you want is a fascinating idea that we have become so normalized to. But like you said, the education system hasn't even blinked at has not evolved, has not modeled. And I think it's churning out a lot of people who are um, used to maybe fit into society in terms of like, getting jobs. But now we're finding it harder and harder because the kiss of death is that now we're building intelligent, automated technologies like with AI that's coming for those jobs that are repeatable and consistent. And so uh, you don't really hear too many people talking about this unless it's like something that seems very far off, like it's gonna be the next generation's problem to deal with. No, it's definitely this generation's problem. Just help the audience understand they can't see you. They don't know how young or how old you are mm -hmm. and where the perspective comes from. So I think it would be good for you to kind of just give us a little update of where you're at in life so that they have a frame of reference. Yeah, sure. So I've uh, successfully completed 22 laps around the sun so far. Um, healthy, thriving, as far as I know. Doing well. My legs aren't that tired, even though it's a pretty big distance traveled. And so I grew up in Northern Virginia. Um, you know, frustrated with the school system, played video games, went to college for one year, realized I had all the education I needed for real estate investment, dropped out of college after one year, got into wholesaling, just off market, single family contract uh, acquisition and assignment, did 150 of those, made a lot of money, got to this point where I was at a retreat in Mexico, March of 2019, and had a conversation that changed my life, where I realized I wanted to not just keep adding you know, stacking more money in my bank account, but I wanted to do something that I could not only, you know, make an impact with, but I could build off of every day. Because at that time I was 19. And what that landed me to was actually building um, intelligent technologies, like with artificial intelligence. And I have these lofty goals and these lofty aspirations. But at the end of the day, I want to utilize very cutting edge technology, solve very practical problems. Because I think the, the, the blessing of technology, and if you look at our phones, you look at cars, you look at whatever, is that over time, it increases the quality of life and it decreases the cost of living. TVs get cheaper, right? The internet gets cheaper. And you're basically passing the torch to the next generation. And now they get to start here. Like I was born in 99. You know, I don't know what it's like. I literally do not know what it's like to not have the internet. I don't know what that's like. And so therefore, I like to think I can see a little bit farther, perhaps, and go a little, you know, see more into the fog of the future because this is my starting line is like where society was, you know, 20 years ago. And so for people that pass the torch from 1980 to 2000, 1960 to 1980, massive accomplishments in each one of those periods, that's seemingly compounding, which is really exciting that the next 20 years is going to basically amount to 80 years of 2021 years of innovation. And when I look at that, and then I look at the problems that are plaguing us as a society, like we're saying education, staying out of um, not being up to date, it is very fascinating for me to just even try and think about what the world's going to look like in 20 years. And then how can I position myself here, be a player in that space and be a voice for good inside of that? Before we talk all about that, let's go back to that conversation. What was that conversation that happened at 19 that changed everything? Yeah, we were talking about just like the philosophical nature of problems themselves. And I realized that the earth does not care when it has an earthquake. It just has an earthquake. Human beings care. It's not a problem to the earth. It's a natural process that's been happening for billions of years. It's what formed our earth, right? And so I realized, okay, if we as human beings create the problems, we're probably going to continue to create the problems. And if we look at where we are today versus 100 years ago, we used to, I would say we have a lot more problems, a lot more complex problems. We're never going to get to the point where we can solve all our problems. And I realized that building a technology that can solve a problem is that solution, that technology is going to expire when there's a new type of problem that comes, right? Just like this very, just like I said, philosophical. And I'll, and I'll get to the realization that we had is I saw that the technology that would last forever and that would continue to provide value to humanity would be one that didn't solve problems but made all problems easier to solve and that sort of ties into how we interface with the world right now we taught we tap into the intelligence of billions of people with our fingers with our thumbs 
But the opportunity is what if that bandwidth was higher? What if we could communicate naturally? What if we could ask questions specific to our circumstances and get the very best advice and have it follow up with us to actually have it make a difference? Because Google's great if you want to learn a fact. But if I could say, hey, you know, I want to lose weight. What is Google going to say? It's going to give me 30,000 different people's opinions when my circumstances like are very unique to me. My value systems are very unique to me. What's going to make the difference for me is specific to me. And so having something that can be hyper-personalized, I saw. I didn't exactly know what that looked like yet. I still don't know exactly what that looks like. We're building the bridge right now of communication so we can have a bigger bandwidth. But that was the conversation that we had was how can we build this thing such that this compounds every single year and that more and more people get to tap into what's going to make the difference for them without having to necessarily even know the questions to ask or have the motivation or have the accountability. That was what came out of that conversation. When you were speaking, I was laughing. And one of the reasons I was laughing is a hundred years ago, people had real problems. Today, we have made up problems. Of course. Yeah. Like, right? We don't have to worry about water. Mm -hmm. We don't have to worry about heat or electricity or a flush toilet or where our food's going to come from. All of these things are pretty much solved. And yet today, most people have more problems than they did 100 years ago, not because they were there, but because they have so much free time to create problems in their mind. Absolutely. Yeah. And in case that we're not, you know, I think we're going to kick education system while it's down. Most people would agree that, hey, it needs to be revitalized. But I don't really have a lot of respect for the people who are saying they're doing stuff because there's not a lot of innovation happening in that space to these to these problems, though. I don't think that I think we've pretty much solved physical survival. And for the rest of the world, you know, technology is creating access. People in Africa right now have cell phones, right? It's just a matter of time until they have decentralized um, electric grids and, and water pretty much as much as they need. I consider that solved because we already have the solutions there. It's just about implementation now. What's not solved is our own mind. And what's not solved is seeing a map of our mind. And what's not solved is seeing exactly what's going to make the difference for us or what are the drivers of our own behavior. What is the source of why we're creating these problems? These are unanswerable questions. We know so little about the mind. We find ourselves in this new world where the quality of life is higher, but mental health and enjoyment of life is lower. It's an interesting paradox. A lot of that probably has to do with media, TV, whatever the, the mechanism is. They learned, and if you go back 100 years ago, 1920s, the amount of marketing that was going on was not what, I mean, it was there, but it wasn't of the level it is today. It wasn't of the caliber it is today. And they did not understand the psychology of what they were doing like they have today. And so all of those things have one underlying driver. If I can make you feel uncomfortable in your life or inadequate and show you that I can solve your problem, you'll hand me your money to solve whatever problem it is that I've now created for you in your life. And that's basically what it is. But the one problem that most people struggle to handle is the reflection in the mirror. And instead of looking at that, they're looking at everything external. And none of that is going to change anything. No, I mean, that's, that's absolutely right. And you're saying, you know, to get their dollars, to get their votes, you know, to get their beliefs, to get people to march for them for whatever it is. It's really interesting to me when I first sort of was birthed out into the world after I left school, I was like, wow, this is not what I thought it would be. Most people are still just figuring it out. Most people seem lost, confused, angry, or upset. Why? Most people don't know. That's the, that's the, that's the interesting thing. And, you know, to go into it, I think that's where balance comes in and being able to have and focus energy and carving out time for all the different dimensions of what does it mean to be a human being? What does it mean to live a fulfilled life? and to live on purpose. I think that's the antidote to this cycle of creating problems to then solve them, to have people fight about them, to then create more problems. I think having people live in authentic alignment for what they see. I've never met an evil person, Rocky. I've never met somebody down to the core who wanted bad for the world. But I have met people who got a little bit out of tune. I like to think we're all like little guitars when we're born and we get banged up as kids, right? 
sometimes we don't have the support to get back into tune or even realize that that is possible. And so we just go and we, we argue or we fight or we kill or we, you know, do all these terrible things, but that's just our self-expression. That's, that's what we think makes the most sense to do in that moment. And one of the craziest realizations I had is like, even for somebody who's like, you know, a murderer, can I honestly say that if I, he and I switch, he or she and I switch places and I live the life that they live and I had the upbringing that they bring and I had all the experience that they brought, would I seriously think that I would do something differently? You know, it's kind of an interesting thing. It's so easy to, to take the moral, you know, high ground and say, oh, I never do that. But that's from our perspective. So deeply getting to, okay, well, what caused those ripples and those compounding effects? How can we get to the source of it? And then how can we dissolve that? such that that is not something that's going to continue to ripple through society. Because I think once you stop the hurt, you stop people from hurting others. And those are the basics of human nature and psychology of how, of what we want at the core. And those, the murder solves that. It gives a person power. It gives them control. It gives them significance. Granted, it's not the right way to do it, but that is the life they've seen as the solution for how they can do it. And when your subconscious gets locked into that, that's what you do because that's the way you've been programmed. And so now it's a matter of reprogramming that and kind of taking that step backward and figuring that out. You said a word that we don't like balance. And the reason we don't like it is because everyone thinks that everything has to be equal, which is impossible. Mm -hmm. So now you've set yourself up for this, this requirement that is so hard to achieve. So we talk about harmony because life is going to have its ups and downs. You're going to have your ups and downs. And just kind of like music, different parts play at different times. And you're never going to be perfect but yet you're creating your song. And so if you live in harmony, yeah, different times, you'll have to follow different things. But overall, if you do it well, it's a life well lived. Yeah, I resonate with that. And, and I see what you're saying about, about balance implying like this equal amount of time spent with your kids versus wife versus um, business. Um, and yeah, I, I don't think that's like effective slicing and dicing. It's not like, you know, cutting a pizza into equal size. They, hey, some things require more time and at different stages, they're going to require more time, more focus, more energy than others. And so, yeah, I love, I love the, I love the analogy there of being in harmony. Makes a lot of sense. So let's talk about one of the things that, uh, you mentioned before we hit record, which is the diamond theory of life. So what is that all about? Yeah, so it's a, it's, a, it's a notion I came up with a couple months ago when I was trying to visualize what a personality was. And I was looking at the language that people used. Um, and they said, you know, he has a bright and shining personality or you have many different sides to your personality. And I was like, wow, they're talking, they're talking about diamonds. And how I tried on, and this is, I truly believe that all beliefs are made up. All beliefs, even gravity, it's made up. We don't know what happens inside black holes, right? <laughs> but we get to choose to keep the ones that serve us. And so the diamond theory of personality basically states that you have a diamond and it's pretty much fixed in terms of the different sides that you have. And I found that most human beings will only discover one to three of those sides that they have. And they'll only spend time polishing one to three of those sides. And when I just tried on the idea and I just asked myself the question, what are the other sides that I might have that I don't know about? I had no idea. I had no idea. And I was like, well, what's, why might I have them? If I just stay in this inquiry, right? Cause I have the business side. I have the, you know, the working hard side. I have the family side. I, I have these identities, but who says that that's just me. Those are just the ones I picked up by default along the way in response to my environment. And so I tried this idea of like, what would it look like if I started getting, if I really started to discover these different sides. And I picked up this hobby called dragon staffing which is one of these staffs, it's carbon fiber, has like this rubber grip, and as he spokes on the end, that light on fire. And you basically spin it really fast and move it, like throw it up and move it all around your body. You've probably seen it like, you know, Hawaii or Thailand or like other, like some of those fire dancing. And I never saw myself to be that person. But now, a couple months into that, I don't know myself without that. And that side that I have pulled back the cover on that I didn't know that I had, but that I was just curious. I was open to trying new things 
has opened up exposure to me of communities of really rad people that I would not have met, that I would not have learned from, that I would not have become a more full person if I had just stayed within the real estate or tech or the business mindset. I want to get to the point where I'm so multidimensional, people struggle to describe what it is that I do or who, who it is that I am. That to me just seems like the most interesting way to live life. And I think there's gold nuggets that come from each one of these different sides. I think you, Paul, you unveil a, a side. I, this is theoretical for me, right? But when you become a father, right? You basically create yourself as a new identity and you get new lessons and new struggles from that. And you get to bring those to everything else. But as human beings, I don't think like who we are is, is what we've accomplished. I think who we are is how well we can interface with a myriad of other types of human beings. I think that's the level of emotional intelligence. I think that's the level of culture that I aspire to be. I don't just want to get along with everybody because I figure out the ways to get people like me. I want to be able to create genuine, authentic connections with any human being, no matter their background, no matter their age, no matter the race, whatever. And for me, when I get to there, then I'll feel like I'll understand humanity. Then I'll feel like I'll understand myself being a part of that. And I'll see how the solutions that we can actually use to work together. Sounds a little cheesy, sounds a little corny, but even if it's just doing our own thing, that sounds a lot better to me than fighting each other, judging each other because we're different. And so I'm on this quest of um, opening my mind right now at this stage of my life and learning about as many different people and people that dress differently or, you know, wear, wear different clothes than me or live in different places. That's like my number one fascination right now. And so we're all programmed, right? And it comes back to what you talked about. We see something, our mind wants to quickly identify it, put it in its box and move along. And the more you see and the less you allow it to be filtered and actually take it in, the more you create that vastness of thought and the ability to see things in a much wider space. And then you can, well, then it comes back. Then you can make the connections. But if you're again making the connections, you're again putting it back into a box. Totally. Yeah. I, I don't know if there's a, like a right way or a correct way um, to live. I don't think so. And I, I, if there is one, each person should look different because we all look, look how different we all look. Our mind, look how different we all grow up. All these different experiences. You know, I, I first couple of years I started, re- I read a lot of books, I listened to a lot of podcasts. And then I got to this point where I sort of saw the same themes happening again and again and again in the podcasts and books, right? And I was like, first I was like, what's wrong here? I was like, oh no, I'm actually just starting to get it. And then I was like, nature, nature is fascinating. And then some of the people I look up to most in my life and throughout history have really said that they learned from nature. And the biggest lesson that I've gotten from nature is that diversity creates sustainability. It's going to be really hard to wipe out life, like really hard to wipe out life because it's so diverse and these systems are so complex built over millions of years that they're pretty much, they can adapt. They can get back into flow if they get out. And so to tie that to the opportunity, I think it is to listen to a call and to answer the call, whatever that is, to, to, to start a business, to make an impact, whatever that means for somebody, to build a technology, to, to have kids, whatever that is, answering that call, you're just furthering humanity one step inside this big tapestry that we're all together. And so trying to do something that doesn't seem in alignment though, I think is like taking steps backwards. It's not moving yourself or it's not moving you know, the world forward. But the opportunity is to see What's authentic to me? And how do I plug that in such that I'm creating the life that I want for myself as well as for those around me inside of that authenticity? I define authenticity as basically not wanting to do anything different, be anyone different, anytime different, anywhere than you are right here, right now. That's my definition of that. And that's where we tap into this like, can, could be considered like I consider it like a divine alignment. I'm, I'm very spiritual. I don't associate with any one specific religion or another um, because again, it's sort of like the labels, right? I want to learn the truths of each of them and I want to be able to connect with everybody. Before we dig into spirituality, as you look around at people your age, do you see you think differently than them? 
And the follow-up to that is how did that happen? Yeah. When I, when I look, I have a really hard time connecting with people my age, actually. I spend, I'm 22. I spend most of my time around people in the thirties and forties and fifties. Right. Um, and I, I think I, I do see things a little differently because I let go of the idea that the world owes me anything. And I let go of the idea that it's this other group that's caused me to have these problems. Right. I take full responsibility for all of it. And so I'm not going to band to a cause with a group making some other group wrong. Cause I understand I could easily join the other group and just keep fighting and that's not going to serve. And I think there's a value to that to a degree, but in terms of the level of personal responsibility for their life, for their direction, I have found that sadly, most people my age seem lost. They seem like they're just trying to figure things out that they, you know, they don't really have an education behind them that set them up for the world in 2022. And mental health like issues are skyrocketing and it's, it's, it's compounding. And then you look at social media and you look at how that has compounded human nature and has expanded these already existing patterns of wanting to impress others. You have most people who go on Instagram and they're seeing like 30 or 40 people they know living perfect lives. And then they're feeling terrible about themselves. So then they feel like they need to compensate and post that, which goes completely against authenticity. And so to some of those degrees, I feel like I've also just had a lot more chosen adversity. I'm very grateful. I was not like left for dead or never had to wonder where a meal came from. But as early as so like once I became conscious and started to go out into the world, I've tackled some really big problems and those have severely humbled me and have given me an ability and appreciation for hard work itself and what it really takes to build things. I don't think that's something that you learn naturally in school. Can you give us an example of one of those? There's a prevailing sentiment And even some people I used to go to school, they think it's about being lucky. And to the degree, like when I, when I, when I left college and then I was like a hundred years later, I'd like wholesale a hundred houses. They're like, oh, he's lucky. Right. And what's, what's fascinating is that they just, they just didn't see the thousand hours of education. They didn't see that the talking and failing forward again and again and again. And to that degree, I think the compound effect is one of the most powerful things. It happens in investments. And I think it happens with relationships more. The more you pour into relationships and the more you pour into investments and a compounding return, now that's exponential growth. Same thing with hard work. That's not a prevailing understanding. A lot of people think it's either like you work hard and you either going to, it's going to work or it's not going to work and has nothing to do with your control. Or if it works out, you get lucky. And if it failed, most people fail. So that's the way it should go. I don't agree with that. Compounding is one of those things that works in every part of life. Uh, Everyone knows about it from money, but it is something that, that, as you said, every single part of life compounds and it compounds plus or it compounds negative. Mm -hmm. And so it's going to go either way. You get to pick. And I think most people don't realize how much a little bit of inaction every single day compounds them to a life not worth living. They wake up one day and they go, how did this happen? A little bit of compounding to the negative day after day after day without thought to it. That's the other, like probably most interesting concept is like to what you said about waking up, like suddenly becoming super conscious and present to the realities of reality and realities of life. Like, what do, you, what do you think causes people to, to wake up? Most people don't wake up until they hit bottom. Mm. And if you don't hit bottom or a place in life where you're so uncomfortable with the way things are that you're willing to change them, that's what it is. Because if you, if you look at people and you look at people who are addicted to drugs or alcohol or money problems, they literally have to hit their bottom, Mm -hmm. right? It's a self-inflicted bottom where they no longer accept it. And it's time that they say, I'm going to do something different going forward. Without that, it's difficult. So it's like they get slapped in the face or they, you know, the water in the pot gets too hot. That's been boiling. And they finally realize, well, I got to get out of here. Correct. That makes sense. I feel like I could, I I almost hijacked that because, you know, 
Jeff Bezos said that when he was young, he was basically asking himself, if I was on my deathbed, or when he was making big decisions, looking back on my deathbed, like from my deathbed, what would be my input to this decision? And that was very powerful. Like for me to think like when I'm 80, 90, 100, 110, you know, whatever, look like, how can I tap into that future version of myself? That person is someone that will still be me, but will be completely inconceivable to who I will be then. How can I tap into the wisdom over there to bring that back to the decisions I make today? And I made that with dropping out of college. Smart move. One of the things that I recommend for people to do is to write their eulogy. Because then you know what you want. And then you can work backwards and figure out what will get me to that eulogy. And what are the steps that I take? And then when you're taking action, you're like, hey, is this in line with what the legacy I want to leave behind is? Yes or no? And it makes it so much easier because you've defined it, you know what you want, and you work it backwards. Yeah, I agree. And I think it's, it's one of those things that, um, you know, death itself is an interesting concept. This, this concept that we're here and that we're not here. Um, a lot of people I found in my life don't talk about it a whole lot, but they talk about it as something that's like, that's never going to happen. Right. And so it's continued instant gratification, short-term gratification, and then they wake up and they wake up on their deathbed. And I think there's a couple of different good books out there on like regrets of the dying. That was probably one of the foundational things to go back to say, why do I think differently than other people my ages? I got to tap into I had a conversation with myself on my deathbed a couple of years ago when I was deciding what I wanted to do with my life. And I tapped into that level of wisdom and that's been my guide. So I think that is one of the things that most young people don't appreciate is time. They just think it's going to go on forever. Death is not at all on their radar screen. And the reality is death and taxes are on everyone's radar screen, whether you like it or not, or you ignore it, we don't get to define it. And maybe that's where, where that wisdom comes from. So that kind of takes us back to where we were with spirituality. So what does spirituality mean to you? I was in the desert last April and I was building a campsite and we built this big like Game of Thrones style fire pit and I was lugging these huge rocks down this hill, like multi hundred pound rocks, flicking, flipping them over. We built this amazing fire. It was very cold out. Um, and so I'm just looking at the fire and I'm just like connecting to the fire for like 30 minutes. And I had the realization of experiencing that all we are is energy. I had known like, n- like knowledge why, like in hedge space that Yes, there's the sun and the sun makes plants grow and animals eat plants and we eat animals and plants and that's how we got here, right? But to actually experience that, that I am walking sunlight and you are walking sunlight and the energy that is powering this technology to work for us to have this conversation, the energy that's powering the neurons in our brain, the lights in this room is all energy that came from the same place. And that was a foundational breakthrough for me of seeing how we are really not so different as we think. And now, I like to say I'm at like level two out of a thousand of understanding energy dynamics and how things really work. Um, and, you know, some people get into frequencies and the way to tap into those with, with breath work and prayer and meditation, all, all that stuff, definitely all very, very impactful and powerful, yet so underrated. And I feel like underappreciated in society at large, because again, that's not part of the programming. That's not part of the operating system that we're given when we're young. And that's not even part of the operating system that we're given in our healthcare system today. So what spirituality really means to me is seeing that if all we are is energy, I, you know, I have an AI company. And so it's like a reflection of looking at our own minds when you build AI. It's very strange. We take in data through our five senses and those data is, that data is basically mapped against an emotional reward system that is geared towards us basically living as high value life as possible for us and others, right? I didn't choose the emotions that I have. I didn't choose the emotional range that I was born into, but I do know the actions that will make me feel different ways. And to that degree, I think it's kind of like a roadmap. And I think spirituality is being able to put together in your own mind with the belief systems that are going to serve you being able to get into authentic alignment 
and follow the roadmap that you were given when you were born. That's what that means to me. In addition to connecting and seeing that the only difference between you or I, or me and anyone listening to this, is the one that we make up in our head, right? That is, that's it. And so being able to bring that level of understanding and appreciation, right? I don't know. I don't do this perfectly. Not even close. I said my level two out of a thousand, I feel. Um, and it's exponential, each one, each level. So that it's like, it's like a way to live life, constantly checking in, getting feedback, not just from other people, but also from yourself and saying, okay, well, why am I feeling this way? Or what doesn't seem right about this? What does my intuition have to say about this? That's that realm for me. That wasn't Burning Man that you were at where you were creating nope. the fire. Okay. Sounds similar. That's Never been why. to Burning Man. Plan to go for the first time this year. Cool. Is it back on? I know they, went, they were online because of... I think it's back on this year. Yeah. I've heard a lot about it. Maybe one day I will go to. Definitely an experience. Absolutely. So yeah, it is, it is amazing how energy works, how our human bodies work, how we can eat a meal and somehow our body takes that meal, which is whether it's plant or animal, and it turns that into new cells in our body that regenerate because every, what is it, every 120 days we're a whole new person as every cell is replaced in our body and somehow this miracle occurs. And for the most part, we still don't understand how it occurs and the mechanisms. And we don't even know how to necessarily control it and adjust the programming and make the changes. And I think science is finally coming back around to understanding this. And there are a lot of groundbreaking stuff happening in biofeedback and a whole bunch of other areas of how this will all come about. So. We shall see. And as you kind of mentioned earlier, the next 10 to 20 years, the magnitude of change is going to be astronomical. So people are going to have to learn to change and change quickly, or they're literally going to be way left behind. Yeah. And I think you can already see that to some degree with the you know companies that are refusing to innovate or even adopt the internet have gone out of business. People that have just, it's a natural order. Right. That's the other thing. Diversity makes nature work, but also the cyclical nature of it. That was that rebirth and cleansing of new, new things, survive, you know, evolution to work. It's happening in accelerated fashion. I think the body is the most intelligent thing in the universe that we, that we know of right now. And I had a thought a few months back. I was like, wow, we had nothing to do with the creation of our body. Really? We have, we, it's something, it is the biggest gift that we are given. And for me, I've started to connect how my body and mind are correlated as it relates to energy. Or if I'm not motivated or if I'm not like able to do the things I want to do, like from an intellectual or creative standpoint, what am I doing with my body? Am I just sitting down? Am I just, you know, getting lazy, getting fat? They're very much intertwined. And I think that will be the most interesting thing in terms of bio and just that entire field of understanding ourselves more deeply as means to elevate our consciousness. And science is just figuring out how all the different parts of our body are connected and how they signal each other and how the different things occur in there. And it's funny that I think a lot of times we think our thoughts control our body, but it's actually our body controlling our thoughts. 100%. And you can see that in people. You can look at a person and see who's angry, right? You can look at their body. You don't even have to know their thoughts. You can look at what they're doing and see that they're depressed. You don't need to talk to them. You can just see it. And it's funny because we talk about that. When somebody walks into the room, you're like, oh, they brought energy into this room, mm -hmm. right? How is that? We, we use the words, but I think we've forgotten how to live. And it's because of all of modern yeah. society, we have forgotten how to be part of the earth, how to pay attention to the weather, how to know what's going on and, and do that because we are ultimately very, very distracted compared to where we were. And now we're being told to go live in a different universe, the metaverse. We're being told to go live in a, in a visual and auditory only you know, universe where we're not going to, you're not going to have the taste. You're not going to have the sense of touch. 
Um, there's a lot of things that are going on today that sort of scare me. Um, and the, the reason it scares me, not because of the technology itself, but because of the intentions behind building that technology. Like Facebook connected the world, sure. But now, with, and with the different platforms, they've connected the world to the point where they have got people addicted because they've used these machine learning algorithms to basically figure out what's going to have you spend most time on it, custom to you. And then how can they get you to spend most time on it? Not because they care about your life, but because they want to make the most money in advertisers. And so to the degree, it's sort of like, should companies like that keep growing? When, when, where is the line? Where is the bar? I think these are questions that we're answering every day as a society. And over the next couple of years, we'll really see how these things shake out because it's all so new and there's no precedent for things like this before. I think there was a movie when you were a little kid that kind of showed the future. We sat little box of a robot, Wally. Mm -hmm. Love Wally. <laughs> But you saw what the, what the future world looked like when everything was automated and essentially, yeah. you know, the metaverse. Everyone was just stuck. And there have been plenty of movies that talk about that. And I think they foretell the future. And people think, oh, that's kind of silly. But if you think about Jules Verne and the books that he read, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, and all of the books he wrote over 100 plus years ago, they show kind of where we are today of what it is. And I think a lot of these movies kind of show what happens to humans when all we do is plug in and forget. So who's to say, but we have the power to change mm -hmm. it. We have the power to disconnect. Well, I guess that's the matrix, right? Red pill, blue pill. <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah. And I think that, that it, that's not, you know, the, I love the matrix and it's obviously dramatized, right? It's, it's very dramatic. Um, but I think we get to do that every time we have a thought. We get to choose. Do we want to take the conscious path, right? Sometimes maybe the harder path, or do we just want to go along with what we've already gone along with because we know it's a predictable result that we might not, we not, we might not love, but at least it's better than, you know, dying. Is there anything you wanted to talk about today that we haven't had a chance to? I love these free form, authentic conversations. Let me, let me check in with myself for like 10 seconds and think. What else is here? Because we've covered a myriad. It's been, it's been amazingly, it's been beautiful. Yeah. What, what, I have my own ideas as well, but I love to hear what you say. What purpose do you think art serves in society and humanity? So that one's a hard one for me. And I'll tell you why. I have always been the logical side, right? The, the tech kid back before any of this crazy tech, you know, I, I was growing up on, uh, on Apple's first computer. And so it, it's just different. I think art expresses and unlocks that certain magical human. It's an experience. And for everyone, it's a different experience. Some of it is kind of, I don't even know how to, to talk about it. The people will create this picture of an orange block and I forget the guy who did it. And someone will pay $200 million for that. Like, Clearly, there's value, but I think it's self-defined. And I think the art world that I grew up in was of a small group of people deciding what art was important. I think in today's world, art is what somebody decides to create and put into the world as their vision. I think it's too defined, especially in schools, right? You have to do it this way. Mm -hmm. This is the definition. I think if you go back to the way humans were, they were free to express it without the judgment in the past. So I don't know if that answers your question. Well, I think, it, I think that you, you said it, which is that it's subjective. And our perspective on it, of course, is going to be subjective. It's just for me, the most interesting thing, because I can connect the dots for pretty much everything that we do to survival. But I have not yet been able to connect art to a need to survive. And so for me, it almost gives us a glimpse into a future where it's not survival focused first. It's creativity and consciousness is self-expression first, which I think, and as like a, as a final note, I, so I think the reason that we struggle as a society is because we have not linked our minds yet. We all want to be happy. We all want to be healthy, right? There's just a scarcity of resources. There's just a limiting amount of resources in the, in the world, on planet Earth, that's preventing us as life, as consciousness from expanding exponentially at the time that we want. So we're constantly pushing the envelope. 
That's my theory. For one person, there's an abundance. But for society as a whole, that's why we want to go and colonize new planets, which is I'm all for. But there's this limiting constraints, the, the, the laws of physics, the, the rules of the playground of the universe, if you will, that we as conscious beings, as life itself coming from a single cell on our planet, have to bear with, but also that allow us to learn about the nature of ourselves and of the universe at the same time. I think we are the universe experiencing the universe and that any distinction or separation that we could see that say that we're big or small is all made up in our head. I agree with you. And I think it's all connected. So yeah. we're all part of the universe. I think we forget that. Mm -hmm. We live on, and for hundreds of years, the earth was thought to be the center of the universe. So yeah. you see how far we've come. And hopefully we will continue to expand further. If people would like to learn more about you, connect, where, where should they go? How do they find out more about uh, who William Brown is? Yeah, if you want to connect with the uh, artistic side of my personality, Instagram at will.jbrown. You'll see me posting videos of uh, me having fun with these fire, lit on fire dragon staffs. Um, that's just been a beautiful creative self-expression for me. And if you want to connect with me on the business and sort of like what my you know purpose is and uh, like what we're building and what our mission is, titanx.ai. Uh, you can just go to titanx.ai and you'll learn about what we're doing and have a chance to connect with me, book some time with me if you want, making that available to everybody. A couple minutes, if you have any follow-up questions or want advice on anything, freely open that time. Just go to that site. There'll be a calling link. You can block a time. We'd love to chat. Thank you so much for being here today. Very much enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. It's an honor and pleasure, Rocky. It's amazing when you can start compounding early in life. Just saying no to what society tells you to do and go learn and take action. Reality is at the end of the day, it's not about the money. It's about living the ultimate life on your terms. And I hope this inspires you to do just that. Next week for our bonus episode, we have Mike DeHaan to share his real estate and life journey. I know you're going to love it. If you enjoyed the episode, I'd appreciate you sharing it. Thanks for listening. Have an abundant week.